Greetings to the commissars. Greetings to the fighters. Greetings to the EFF structures in Africa and the people of the world. Mandis Bulisele Namlanj. My name is Tombovio Veronica Mende, National Chairperson of the Economic Freedom Fighters in South Africa. In the midst of this pandemic caused by the coronavirus, the EFF took an initiative to read against the coronavirus. And in the previous readings that other commissars have presented, we spoke about capitalism. We spoke about the things that capitalism do not tell you about. We spoke about the EFF founding manifesto. And in the founding manifesto, there are questions that are asked and there are questions that are answered as to why is capitalism still thriving? Why have we not defeated it? Now, in trying to answer that question, today we are dealing with the book by David Harvey, The New Imperialism. But we are specifically dealing with the subject of accumulation by disposition. Who is David Harvey? David Harvey is a British born Marxist. He is a geographer, he is an anthropologist, he is a professor. Now, David Harvey specializes in geography and what they call what is called Marxist geography. So David Harvey analyzes periods and eras of capitalism. So he's a critical analyst thinker analyzing the classic political economy of our times locates them in different periods and will then determine where we are there was a stage of colonialism the stage of imperialism now, David Harvey, using the global economy struggles, he determines this time using this analysis tool of Marxist geography as the new imperialism. Is the new imperialism how? We are going to get to that. Now, he draws his inspiration from different Marxist scholars. When he writes this article, he quotes a lot of Vladimir Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, Tandy, Kamkanda Weary, John Chang, and others but mostly he bases the arguments on Marxism. Now he says, this new imperialism is exerted on others by the superpowers. No one is colonizing themselves but there are superpowers that are imperialist countries 
and capitals that are progressing the agenda of this new imperialism. At the center of this book, he puts the US. Why is he putting the US at the center of this book? He's putting the US at the center of this book because it is deemed to be the superpower, but there are others, there is the superpowers in the Europe. Now, how does the US being a superpower not assist other countries, but oppress them through imperialism? Let's look at the examples of how the Bretton Woods institutions were established and how the mandate of the Bretton Woods institutions changed over time to oppress and capture the other countries. Now, the Bretton Woods institutions are the IMF and the World Bank. You could otherwise call them the international financial institutions. So their initial mandate after the World War II was to assist the countries to get back into shape, build their economies, build the destructive infrastructures, and help them get off all the ills of the war. But when we got into 1982, the IMF and the World Bank changed the mandate. Who is influencing this change? It's the US. And this change, we see it by how the conditions are attached to the loans that are given to other countries. So they start by getting involved in decision making of government budgets that will condition you on how you budget as a government of a country, that will condition you on how you price the agricultural products, that will condition you on how the labor markets must operate. And they will even tell you to privatize some of the sectors of the economy within the countries. They will even get involved in industrial regulations. Now, if you are restricted that much, how do you then industrialize? You, the country becomes a stagnant economic machinery that does not produce anything. And in that stagnation, if any country does not industrialize because of the restrictions, can you even pay back the loan that you were conditioned to pay? If you don't determine your own pricing of the agricultural sector, it means the production of agriculture could be far less. You can create unemployment out of it, but the bottom line is that you have to pay back. That is why today we find so many, many countries having the highest debts against their GTPs to the IMF and the World Bank. And there's no way out because you always go back. You're going back because why? All these conditions, they force the countries to adopt neoliberal policies, policies that do not help, policies that take from the poor, give to the rich at the expense of building its own economy. Now, in the 1990s, more stringent measures were placed in the IMF and the World Bank. They get involved in the democracy of the country. 
they get involved in the central bank independence and how corporate governance to, should work and the decentralization of government itself. Now, all of these are advocated and advanced by the superpowers. And if countries try to respond to stagnation of economies, you find some instabilities being created. And then these instabilities, at the center of these instabilities, you would always find the US. Let's take, for instance, the case in Venezuela and the instabilities that were created through the oil production, the Syria, the Iraq, Cuba. There's, a, there's an existing embargo now in Cuba. There's a power struggle of the superpowers to access the resources of rich countries and impose their own conditions on them. Now, governments at some point, they retaliate. And when they retaliate, David Harvey in this book, he mentions Saddam Hussein, Hugo Chavez. I will mention Robert Mugabe. I would mention Fidel Castro, Muammar Gaddafi. What happens to these leaders when they re respond to this oppression, imposing of neoliberal policies, imposing of appropriating the resources? They either get sanctions, they either get assassinated, they either get embargoes. So what will the US do? They will play a good Samaritan role. You know what, a, what we refer a good Samaritan as? We could refer to a person who gives with the kindness of their heart as a good Samaritan. But Hajun Hang says these are bad Samaritans because their intention of helping and assist or assisting these countries are not based on anything good but based on new imperialism methods and systems. Many countries were given independence, but there's nothing independent about them. So what does the US does in sustaining its hegemonic position in the global capitalism? We see China kept its economy going, absorbed its surplus labor, ensuring that many people are employed. There will be no strikes that are unintended, build the capacity of the state. In infrastructure, created its own banks, agricultural banks, land banks, and held its own people. And in so doing, David Harvey mentions Taiwan, Indonesia, Iraq, South Korea. All of them started building their own economies. And when they were building their own economies, then there was no reliance or dependency on the US to a point where 
their exports were directed to China. Now, China, even when it was absorbing the capital value of its Asian countries, there was no crisis. Now, Asia started to consolidate. Europe has consolidated. The US is playing big brother. But there is Africa here that is not consolidated. So what happens to Africa that is not consolidated, which does not speak in one voice? Let's go back to the IMF. The IMF helps the US as and when it gets to economic crisis. But Africa, because of the trading regulations by the World Trade Organization, which by the way, is also the establishment of the US. We are all member states of the WTO. And some of the countries were forced to sign the membership to the WTO to a point where South Korea had to sign the membership because it was a condition on the IMF loan, which it needed to save itself. Now, when Africa comes, and it comes with bad credit rating. Who credited it? The Moody's. Who are the Moody's? The credit ratings were started in the US. And John Moody in 1909, came with the ratings regulations that happened to be accessed widely and made sense to be used as a measure to rate the superpower, the poor country. And both these people are rated with the same method. Now tell me if it makes sense. You are from Africa. You've been colonized all your life. You have never had an opportunity to build your economy. Now comes a rating agency that is based on the regulation that rates the superpowers, gives them the highest credit rating, comes to you, use the same measurement and rate you the lowest. Now your credit rating obviously is going to be low because your standard of the economy is not the same as the standard of the established, the well-developed countries. You are a developing country, others are underdeveloping countries, but there is no difference. There is no different regulations for these countries. Now, these African countries, they go to the US with their bad credit rating, to the IMF with their bad credit rating. They are rated. They get this bad credit rating, they borrow money, and their interest rates shoot up the roof. They come to a point where they just have no chance but to accept the conditions. Conditions that will even tell you how to budget for your social development of a country. Now you, there are people here, they need free education. They need health. They need food. They need to build agricultural industries. 
They need to build their infrastructure, railways, airports, water, sanitation, you name it. Basic necessities. You are conditioned to cut on that budget. How are you going to grow? You will not grow because your dependence on, on the other side is growing the debt on your budget. Now, many countries in Africa, they have passed 50% mark of their debt to their GDP. And tell me how many more other years will it take for these countries to pay back? So that's a form of dispossession, of access to basic services of African countries by the imperialists. And the WTO comes with the regulations. Hajun Hang argues that when the decisions are taken in the meetings of the WTO, all the superpowers come to a room called a green room. And they make these decisions. When they go out, it's a matter of who can convince the other much quicker. The ones with no economic power, they have no say but to accept whatever decision comes out of the green room. So David Harvey makes an example with President Lula of Brazil. He says the US at some point threatened Lula that if he does not accept the conditions of trade, he will find himself trading with undertaker. Imagine if you are going to be cornered like that and you are a president of a workers' party. You have the, the middle class, you have the workers, you have the poor of the poorest that you have to protect. You have to protect the industries, mostly the infant industries of your countries which are exposed to danger. What then happens? Those industries, they die. And then the superpowers provide for you. We sit here with the textile industry killed by the regulations. The infant industry of in the textile could not be protected even by working class organizations, the unions, even when they wanted to use the anti-dumping rule, they could not protect it. Then what do we do? We consume. We can't export as small countries. We consume. We were made in China, made there, made there. We don't have something made in our countries. It comes to us, it's very cheap. Even if it's our industry is trying to grow big, we find the regulations keeping us and the pricing of our final product at the lowest, which is not going to help us. And the other example is just recently, the dumping of chickens to South Africa. When Rob Davids came and reported that, no, I can, I'm trying to use the anti-dumping rule, this and that, Brazil wrote back, it's never done. This is what you have to do. The World Trade Organization says it's never done. He comes back, he reports, no, I don't want the trading war. Let's accept. What happened to the poultry industry in South Africa? 
it's dying because the market is closed with cheap chicken that's coming from elsewhere. Now we are consuming a surplus value of someone else. We are not producing anything. Instead, we sit within unemployment. We sit with the economy that does not grow because there's so many people that are unemployed. We sit with the industry that is not growing because you're killing it. Textile, kill. Poultry industry, you kill. Crop farming is already squeezed. We are receiving crop farming products elsewhere. It's already squeezed. It's not going anywhere. It, it, it's not growing. And what do you call that? That's disposition. So when Lula was trying to fight back and eventually accepted, the same Brazil sees it with, no, this thing works. Let's throw it back to others. And now it becomes an insecure space where one can get anything imposed on them. You're trying to fight back. You cannot really fight back because there are stringent rules of the World Trade Organization, which, by the way, owes its allegiance to the US, to the NATO, to the G7. Where now, Mubai? You are an African country. Let me just branch off a bit. So, this vulnerability of Africa comes from resisting the unity of Africans. If the Africans are resisting the unity of speaking for Africans in Africa, we missed an opportunity in Addis Ababa 1963 to speak in one voice. When the Casablanca group came and convinced us, the likes of Libya, Ghana, Egypt, Morocco, come, they came to Casablanca with a mandate that Africa must be one. The Morocco, Morocco group was like, eh, okay, um, no, let's coexist. We are fine. We can survive as these countries from the Berlin conference. We are fine. And the rest of them are like, mm -mm, let's take it slowly. Let's take it slowly. Let's see what we can do. Let's go individually as African countries, all 54 of us. Let's go, let's build slowly, let's build slowly. And there will be a point where we come together and we build. I like how Dr. Kwao presents the unity of Africa. Dr. Kwao was in the AU with Dr. Nkosa Zanadlamini and became, became a UN ambassador from the AU. So when she found a world stage, she went to fight for Africa. She unearthed a lot of colonial, rule that was keeping Africa under oppression. Now, Africa is not united. Africa doesn't speak with one voice. Even us as Africans, we treat each other like animals, but we don't treat anyone from the US like that. 
We don't treat anyone from China like the way we treat each other. That is why it's easy to take advantage of this one continent called Africa. When everyone else around us has consolidated, we remain divided. Even when our pan-Africanist fathers told us the danger of us not speaking with one voice, we are going to be vulnerable to the forces of the superpowers. They came, they get assassinated, even with our help. So President Robert Mugabe, may his soul rest in peace. More than 25 years ago, he arrests a son of Margaret Thatcher in Zimbabwe. On the way to stage a coup in Equatorial Guinea, because there was an oil establishment happening there. So you see how this new imperialism comes. How does a son of Margaret Thatcher from UK come and destabilize a country in Africa simply because they want access? How do they get such information? Of course, they are involved, but who do they use? They use Africans. So as investigation is going on, it's then found that, no, there's someone who wants to overthrow the current ruling president, and they want to be president themselves. And they get the superpower to stage a coup, cause this destabilization Meantime, the oil is going to be processed, go out. Before we know it, we've lost it. I want to bring it home again. There's been a mention of the oil found in Mossad Bay, here in South Africa. And Mysteriously, the MPRDA that governs mineral resources in South Africa is withdrawn. What is happening? Who withdraws it? The cabinet of South Africa. And when the cabinet of South Africa withdraws it, you question it. How do you withdraw it? There is a very valuable resource found now in Mosul Bay. We need this to be in place because we need to take control of who goes in there. Because our government should be in charge of all mineral resources. So when there is no law to govern the mineral resources, anyone can come, employ their own rule, do whatever they want. When the MPRJ comes back, there's already a rule in place. We can't really do anything about it. So this is how the superpowers work. And they use one of your own to oppress you. At a point where U.S. wanted to play a good Samaritan into the African countries and other countries in Asia. It will 
pretend to be helping you with finances, with this military, but at the very same time, it flexes the very same muscle of economy and the military to destabilize you. To this date, in Africa, we have 29 military bases of the US. We have our own armies, we have our own armament. But for some reason, we have US military bases in our own continent. We have French military bases in more than 14 countries. In fact, we still have countries that are paying the colonial tax to France. Even when there is some sort of independence and democracy, how is that possible? That's new imperialism. It's a colonization of a special type. And David Harvey looks at these things as they unfold. Analyze them, locate them, and coin not a term that never existed, but will give you that it's a continuation of colonialism and imperialism. And, but it is just in a new form of like, we are friends, but we are not friends. There's just bad Samaritans. Now, coming to over accumulation. Let's just take it back a bit. TG, when she was presenting the 23 things that the capital are not telling us, she makes an example of a rock driller in Lonmin in Margana that ends far less than a rock driller in London. But the people who are receiving dividends are receiving everything the same. So Komisam Buseni, when he unpacks Marxism, he shows us how the accumulation of capital is achieved. He shows us uh, that if labor power and the means of production, then they come together, they produce a commodity. This commodity goes on sale. But this commodity will only go on sale when there is realization of value. So David Harvey places the realization of value on three things. That there should be a need, a want, and a desire for a certain product to go to the market. And if there is no need, there's no desire, there's no want, of that particular product, it will not go to the market. It could be in the market, but it won't sell. So that surplus value does not get to be converted into money for reinvestment. Does not get to be converted into money 
for reinvestment. If the demand is less, then the accumulation of capital also becomes less. But then there becomes a problem because laborers, the people on the factory floor, they are retrenched, they don't get paid. So when the demand is high, everyone is happy. The laborers on the factory floor receive their wage labor. The capitalist pays for the means of production and receive profit. But what do they do with the profit? They take the profit, reinvest it. What happens to the laborer? You as the laborer, you will only get what's determined and stipulated in your contract as a salary. So let's just say you go to a firm that's producing steel. The means of production, um, the machines, the material and everything is costing the firm 50 rand a day. A ratio to one person. Now you go in, you are told per hour, you earn more or less two rand and you are going to work eight hours. So your eight hours is 16 rand. Now, on the factory floor, you are 10, you are 20. By the time you reach four hours on the factory floor, you've already covered the expenses of the production cost, even the market cost. So whatever else, which is access to that comes to the owner in a form of money. They divide it amongst themselves, they reinvest. But there is a demand of machinery. And as technology progresses, there's new machines, there's less people required and everything. So capital can exist. Those that are producing machines will sell to the others that require that machines. But at the factory floor, they need one person to operate the machine. Now what happens to the rest of the other people when there were no machines? They must go home. Now when there is no people working, there's no one who buys, whether there is a need, a want or a desire, no one buys anything. Now that's where over accumulation happens. So when capital over accumulates, they expand the market. They change it all together. They go and explore in other areas and countries. A cell phone company will over accumulate, comes to another country, studies a new market, starts it, and progresses in that. But this cycle at some point should end. It does not end. Because once there's too many machines that are, are reliant and producing any commodity and there's no people working, there is not going to be a demand in the market for anything. 
But for some reason, this is not happening. Now, let's take what happens in the minerals. They are billionaires. They've accumulated enough. They can take their profit, reinvest it in a social program, build schools for new skills, geologists and everything that's required in the mine. That does not happen. They can build hospitals, big hospitals, not clinics. That does not happen. They can build infrastructure. That does not happen. But what happens once whatever mineral they were up to gain, once it depletes, they leave. Whoever is left behind, there's no infrastructure, there's no one working, there is poverty. Everything is a mess. So they dispossess and leave. And they were not going to lose anything by selling shares and build the skill that is going to benefit everyone in the areas where they are. Instead, they were going to build capital and share on the wealth of the country with everyone. That does not happen. Now, why there is no share of wealth? Why isn't it redistributed? Even when these people have acquired so much. It's the edge and the need on what they call individualism. That I must just get whatever, even if I don't need it. That's just the mentality of capital. So, as and when they share, they can redistribute the wealth. They see that as socialism. We are like, no, we cannot coexist with socialism. But them as capitalists, the capitalists, they have no successes. They don't want to build. They don't want to redistribute. They don't want socialism, but they have no successes. So where are we and what happens? Now, David Harvey was having a seminar and with his friend Giovanni Arrighi, who's an Italian economist, also a very clear Marxist scholar, they are having a conversation on why is this system not ending? He asked the question why? Why are the global structures of capital accumulation still thriving? How, how is it even possible? David have a response and said, no. They no longer use the system of primitive accumulation, which is calm, take people out of their land, dig the minerals, go out, um, exploit the living labor, exploit people, leave holes everywhere, leave people sick of the dust, don't take care of the environment, and don't build infrastructure. Now they don't do that anymore. That's why the capitalists are thriving. Are thriving. There is a new system now that they are using of dispossessing people. And that system does not require living labor, does not require to remove anyone or disadvantage anyone from their land. 
So how does this system happen? This system happens in this way. When Marx speaks of capital, he says there is a centralization of capital. And it's, it is achieved by offering credit. So small companies start company, you need a capital to build, you need to, to, to establish something and sell a commodity to someone. But then you do not afford whatever starting capital you are having is too little to afford what you want to start. You go to credit, borrow, you come back, you build. But in building and extending your company, employing new people, providing services here and there, you find yourself with a shortfall or your operational cost and your income do not match. So your income falls short to cover all your operational costs. Now you go back and borrow to have at least stability. And once your income is stable, then you can cover all your operational costs. You pay your laborers, you buy your products, the machinery, everything you can rent. If you're renting, you can buy property if you're buying property. But at some point, capital has a way of stopping you from getting more credit. So as individuals, we suffer from something called consolidation loans. So you go, you have a credit here, you owe a car, and you owe clothing, you owe small, small, small debts. But for some reason, your salary do not cover that. Then you go for what is called consolidation. They pay all that debt out for you. But they give you a new loan. There's nothing saving you on that. A new loan based on your credit rating. You were struggling, you were not paying. So you defaulted over time. Your credit rating is not good. Your score is not good. Now you get a new loan nevertheless. They pay all your debt. They, they cover everything. Now you are, you, you are left with this one debt. Looks small, looks very, very small when you pay it back. But when you add its interest based on your credit scoring, it's too high. And in that way, they take money from these companies. Then at some point they stop. Now, when you have a consolidation, low you are not legible legible to get another loan because you are deemed as someone who cannot pay the same thing happens to companies so when they have given you a loan as a company they don't give you another one so they stop the liquidity that flow of liquidity into your company you default, you can't pay back certain things and everything, then a good Samaritan with lots of money will come, buy you out and continue with what you were doing. Let's take, for instance, SAA. Now, it's a typical example that came to mind 
when the flow of liquidity is stopped. So SAA has troubles, uh, money problems, even when they borrow, they still, their income still falls short and all that and all that. So the state gives up. and invites whoever can afford. Who affords? The capitalists. Then what's going to happen to the people of South Africa? They are going to be dispossessed of their own airline. So whoever was having surplus value in their position is up to buy the airline of a country and in that system there is no exploitation of labor there is no exploitation of uh, uh, um, anyone it's just simple money that was sitting somewhere having nothing to do. A person with a lot of money will come and buy SAA. Take it, keep it for some time, because as it's going to be marketed, it's, 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 it, it's gonna file for bankruptcy and the system as it goes, it could go for liquidity, uh, liquidation, which is voluntary. And in the process of that, many people are going to lose. They're going to lose benefits, medical benefits. They're going to lose pensions. They're going to lose wages. The country is going to lose an airline. But someone is acquiring a whole airline. So that's how they accumulate by disposition. So when that person buys, now they will buy it at the cheapest price available. Keep it, rebuild, do whatever, rent out the aircrafts and everything, all the assets. Then once the economy comes back stronger. That person will sell it. Likelihood is that South Africa will go back and buy the very same SA from the person. But the difference will be, we might be buying it 10 times the price. Why didn't we save it now? So this is how capitalism sustains itself. Now it's dispossessing people to feed its own sustainability. Now, there is another element that comes into play. And it's, it's mostly one of the conditionalities that come with on the IMF when they borrow countries' money. They will tell you, privatize your state-owned entities. You don't need them. You can't afford them. You privatize them, but you need them. How do you privatize water? South Africa has dams that belong to private people, not government. How do you privatize such? It's a basic necessity. So for some reason, you a country will be convinced that no, privatize. Privatization is the best. These people can run it for you and what, but at what cost? Let's go back to the example of the SAA. Let's just say it's now privatized, it's sold and whatnot. Will we afford to fly on any of the airlines in South Africa. 
we will not afford to fly. The prices that were subsidized by the country will be now higher. The prices will not be affordable. So the competition of the airlines, we were finding cheaper airlines. And as, a, as we were finding the cheaper airlines, is because of the market and the competition. So if they are competing with the highest price, their prices will also go high. And who will then afford to fly? Only the rich will afford to fly. And anyone else who's poor or who lives from hand to mouth will not afford to fly anymore because we are dispossessed of a country's airline that was subsidized by government to be affordable for the people of the country. Now, there's another element of accumulation by disposition, land grabbing. It's often associated with poor people that we grab land, we stay in it forcefully and all that. Capital has always seized moments of crisis. So when there's crisis in any country and the economy is its, in its lowest, they seize that moment, grab the land, buy portions, big portions of land, and when they buy these big portions of land, they keep them. They either rent them out to even governments for forestries, for business, and for any other business. Or they sell them, they sell that land. So when they sell the land, they sell the land at the highest cost. That is why there is a problem of many countries when they need to build infrastructure, they don't have enough land in their position to build. They must first beg the capitalists and buy the land back from them to build whatever they have to build, to use it for whatever facility. It could be for crop farming. It could be for infrastructure. It could be for residential areas. Now government must go and buy it from everyone who have seized the moment of crisis when the economy was at its slowest. And then there will be selling it back. And then what happens to the liquidation? During liquidation, there are workers. Those workers were getting subsidized pensions. They were getting medical aids. They're getting wages. Now, many companies, private companies, when they want to rebuild on their capital, they gun for the disposition of the rights of the workers. Go plead bankruptcy at court. Go plead bankruptcy at court and thereafter 
the court decides, let's then get rid of some of your obligations. When we are getting rid of some of your obligations, you can then go back to your feet. And what are these obligations that the first thing they go for is that can we get rid of the pension subsidy? Can we not subsidize workers? Can we not subsidize the medical aid? Then the workers are deprived of their social right to pension. There is a very interesting element of accumulation by disposition, which Tandika Mkanda we recalls it neo-patrimonialism, but we read it with kleptocracy, which is in paragraph 24 of the EFF founding manifesto. So neo-patrimonialism is a system that is a very selfish system that does not know bureaucracy of government. Whoever has the closest proximity to power gets whatever they want. So the president and the, and the cabinet of a country determines what will be the agenda of an administration. So because capital and the superpowers do not contest elections in other countries, but they want access to the resources, to the people, to abuse every opportunity of that country's existence and take from the poor to themselves, but they have no way in. The only people available is the president and the cabinet. So neoliberal policies will be introduced, designed to accommodate a need of a superpower, a need of another country, a need of the capitalist society to come into the country and exploit its resources. They do this because there is a never ending, excessive, perpetual greed of many, many leaders. So they use this system to sell whatever is left of that country to whoever can buy it for themselves. There's only one person who's going to gain there, the leaders. Everyone else is not going to gain anything. Now, pharmaceuticals, we have to make an example of that. Why are many countries do not have pharmaceutical industries? Why are they dependent? on the superpowers for pharmaceutical needs. Why our laws cannot help us to industrialize and build pharmaceuticals? It's because governments do not want to make such laws. So when you cannot contest elections of a certain terrain where you want anything from it, you utilize the neo-patrimonialism system 
get into that particular country through the buying of power. Some of you will understand that most recently, a certain president rising to power was through the buying to an amount of a billion rent. And when those people are sent to power, they make the laws that suit and designed to accommodate the capitalists and the superpowers. They will not industrialize, but they will privatize. And in them privatizing, who loses the people? So we see how we are very far from socialism and how we cannot ever defeat capitalism. But David Harvey makes a very good argument. He says, if the working class can rise, we can all defeat capitalism. He makes an example with how the workers in the US woke up one day, decided that everyone who was in the airline industry is not going to go to work. They're gonna shut down. There was not going to be an operation. There's no traveling in, traveling out. And everything is going to be on a standstill. And at that moment, when they were spoken to, they retreated. But when they retreated, there was a lot of damage that could crumble the country's economy. Now South Africans, Africans, and the people of the world, we are in a different era of our lives. There's a pandemic in our hands. We are all urged to stay at home. We are all urged to keep a safe distance. We can only beat this if we all listen, understand, see what is happening outside. We see what is happening in Italy. We see how the people are dying. And we share the pain of those who have lost their loved ones to the pandemic. We share the pain of those that are lying in hospitals. But mostly we plead with everyone, please stay at home. Wash your hands with soap and water for no less than 20 seconds regularly. And also use a sanitizer when you cannot wash hands. But just stay at home and not go out when it's not necessary to go out. To those that are having the founding manifest of the EFF in hand, please go read paragraph 24, political position. It reflects on how accumulation by disposition on, on how capitalism will thrive. It reflects on how the liberation movement will lose credibility. And when they lose that credibility, they are going to sell the power of everyone to the highest bidder. We're going to see how the labor unions 
are going to retreat, get into the system, exploit the very same people they are supposedly representing to gain anything for themselves. We've seen how kleptocracy has crippled our country and countries in the world. We see how rent-seeking kickbacks of the leaders have crippled our economy. So people accept bribes simply because they only want to fulfill a desire of their own greed. But let's not lose hope. One day, Africa is going to be for Africans. The disposition today is going to stop. Thank you very much. I'm out.